So my name is Carrie. I'm sometimes called the Coffee and Conversation Counselor. I have a private practice in Riverview called Coverdale Counseling and Consulting. In that practice, I work in multiple domains, but I have a particular interest in compassion fatigue, vicarious traumatization, and professional burnout, as well as working um, in self-esteem, uh, balance, and anxiety. I work both in office, currently via telehealth, and at my farm, Storms Run, doing equine assisted psychotherapy, which is a really cool and exciting modality. So today kicks off the first of four sessions on CBT coping skills for anxiety. So that's cognitive behavioral therapy, coping skills for anxiety. Today in session one, we're gonna be covering anxiety vulnerability management. It's a big mouthful. It's not as daunting as it sounds. So bear with me. We're going to go through this. You're gonna learn a little bit about anxiety. I'm gonna apologize for my seasonal allergies and my super crazy congestion. Um, and we're gonna have a, a great time learning some new skills. So week one, and I'm going to apologize. I am using multiple devices to make sure I get all the information. So let's talk anxiety vulnerability management. This is week one. So this is really about learning whether you think you have more anxiety than other people. This is where we're gonna talk about why and begin to learn to, to use those CBT skills to fight your anxiety. Next week, um, we're gonna be talking about relaxation and mindfulness. Um, what we can do, how to find relaxation strategies, even when you feel like you simply can't relax, and these will help you to find less stress, less tension in your life. Um, week three, we're going to be hitting it on exposure and desensitization. Um, this is how we can learn to avoid avoidance. And in week four, we'll be looking at some really specific cognitive therapy skills, why our thoughts matter, and how we can change them. So those are the four weeks. Um, each session is scheduled for two hours. We will not take the full two hours at any time. That's really to make sure that we have enough time to cover all the material and answer any questions that may come up. I will not go over the two hours and typically will be one hour to one hour and a half. So let's talk questions. What is CBT? So what is cognitive behavioral therapy? It is a short term, evidence-based treatment for many, many, many mental health concerns, including anxiety. It's based on the principle that our cognitions or our thoughts, our behaviors or our actions and choices, and our emotions or feelings all impact each other. The basic premise of CBT is ultimately that emotions are really difficult to change directly. So in CBT, we target emotions by changing our thoughts and by changing our behaviors that contribute to distressing emotions. Being aware of and changing how we act, think, and respond to emotions can help us really prevent anxiety from controlling our lives. And I apologize, I'm a hand talker and I know my hands are going out of screen. I just, I'd have to sit on them if I wanted to stop. Um, we really want to be sure when we're engaged in therapeutic processes that the treatment is effective. That's really important. So evidence-based ultimately means that there is scientific evidence that shows that something works. And CBT is an evidence-based treatment that has been studied and shown to be effective in hundreds and hundreds of specific scientific experiments. And while there is no 100% guarantee that CBT will work for you, it is likely that with practice and with hard work, you will begin to see the benefits of these techniques and you will experience the positive outcome in your life. CBT ultimately builds a set of skills that will enable us as individuals to be aware of our thoughts, our emotions, identify how situations, thoughts, and behaviors influence those emotions, and will help us to improve our feelings by changing dysfunctional or disruptive thoughts and behaviors. And ultimately, the process of CBT skills acquisition is collaborative, which is why we're doing it together, which is why, you know, I will challenge you to ask yourself some questions. I will challenge you to practice these skills from week to week. Excuse me with my super crazy allergy. Uh, so, for example, I'm going to pop up an example here with a situation. Let's assume that you're required to do a presentation in front of a large group. Okay, we've all had that experience. 
perhaps, perhaps you have an experience where you want to do this, but you have a thought and it's, I'm going to practice. I'll do great. Okay. Your emotion in that case is confident. It's anticipatory. It's, it's powerful. Your behavior is that you practice and you complete the, the presentation without any problem. If you're struggling with anxiety, you might say, oh my gosh, I'm going to make a fool in front of, my, of, of myself in front of everyone. I'm going to mess up. Your emotion in that case is anxious. It's worried. It's fearful. It's scared. It's fretful. What happens? The behavior? You put off practicing, avoidance, attempt to get out of doing the presentation, uh, find excuses, and perhaps ultimately don't do such a great job because you're so worried and afraid. In CBT, what happens is that the, the therapeutic process works by identifying and addressing how a person's thoughts and behaviors interact to create that anxiety. So, you know, as a therapist, I would work with clients to help them recognize how their negative thought patterns influence their feelings and behaviors. So in this particular example, we have two very different examples of how thoughts and behaviors impact. With CBT, we attempt to intervene by changing those negative thought patterns, teaching relaxation skills, changing those behaviors that lead to the worsening of the problem. To help provide motivation for the treatment and get, get you on board, it can be really helpful to just understand anxiety, right? That's kind of the first step, right? Like, what the heck is it? And how does it show up? And why does it bother us? Well, there's a lot of research around psychotherapy and how it can be helpful. And we continue to learn more and more about how it is beneficial for many people. But because everybody's brains are different, um, because everybody processes differently, it will be really important to recognize that what happens to be helpful for Jane may not be helpful for Marcel. And what's helpful for Marcel may not be helpful for Mahmoud. So it's really important to recognize that while the therapeutic principles are beneficial to all, the intricacies or the specifics may be different from person to person. So it's important that we hang on to that. So we're going to be talking in more general terms around how to help you. More specifics would be appropriate fodder for one-on-one -on -one counseling. Pardon me. So let's talk anxiety. Right now, we're going to explore some really important information about anxiety itself. And the first step to managing it is understanding it. Know our enemy, so to speak. Colin Hightower said, we experience moments absolutely free from worry. These brief respites are called panic. Now, while I don't necessarily agree 100% with that, I do understand that sometimes we get into panic state. Anxiety is a part of our body's natural alarm system. It's our fight, flight, or freeze response. This exists to protect us from danger. It's an evolutionary process. And these natural body responses are not harmful, but they can admittedly be very uncomfortable. And the most pure form of that fight, flight, or freeze response is what's called a panic attack, right? This is, involves a rush, like a huge rush of those anxiety symptoms. Um, and I'm going to list some of those in a moment. Usually peaking in a time span of about 10 minutes. In that case, the body is trying to tell us that something dangerous is happening right now. Now, this may be a real or a perceived danger, but our response is that of of panic and other forms of anxiety that are less acute but just as debilitating would be things like chronic worry and this would involve symptoms similar but on a smaller scale however in those cases it's like our body is saying something is going to happen in the future so watch out right so a panic attack is something dangerous is happening right now chronic worry or chronic anxiety is is less acute it's about future thinking the difference between the two is ultimately really the intensity of the experience and the context in which it is activated or triggered. So as we work through this series, we will be referring to anxiety symptoms as being related to the fight, flight, or freeze response at all times. And the most common anxiety symptoms 
excuse me, I'm going to share with you in a moment. And you might want to jot some down as we go. And I'm going to encourage you as we go through these four weeks to write down anything that helps you or is of worthy of consideration. So here are some common anxiety symptoms. So physical. Okay. If we were doing this in real life, I'd say raise your hand if, right? If these are the symptoms that you have experienced, rapid heart rate, sweating, trouble breathing, maybe you feel the tightness in the chest or chest pain or a heaviness, um, you might feel dizzy or lightheaded, feeling like things aren't real, like you just kind of disconnected or dissociated, feeling like you don't feel like yourself, perhaps some tingling in your extremities, fingers, toes, you may experience nausea, vomiting, um, or, or heartburn, reflux, some muscle tension or tightness. You may experience low energy or a feeling of utter exhaustion. Um, you may have shaking or jitters like you've had way too much coffee. Um, you may feel that a fluctuation in your body temperature, either chills or feverish or flushing. You may get red faced. Um, you may have some experience, um, some changes in your vision, blurred. Um, you may have a strong urgency to urinate or defecate. Um, there may be gastrointestinal distress, such as diarrhea or constipation. Um, you may have some experience changes in your other senses. So it's really important to recognize that there is a very wide range of physical responses. Then we have cognitive responses. So these are the you know, things that happen internally. So we would have worries. Right, that's the future thinking. Negative thoughts about your ability to tolerate those emotions, to tolerate your experience. Negative predictions about future events. Oh, I know what's going to happen. Um, other common thoughts that people have, you know, I'm going crazy, I'm gonna have a heart attack. That's very common in panic attacks. People think they're having, experiencing a cardiac event. Um, I'm going to faint. People feel so lightheaded that they, they're very certain that they're going to, to go down. Um, you may feel that you have trouble concentrating or keeping you know, attention. Um, you may have some, some fantastical or magical ideas, phrases or images, you know, repetitive behavior such as, I need to wash my hands um, or I will die or someone else will be harmed. Um, you may have a preoccupation with your bodily sensations, your bodily functions, um, with personal hygiene and so on. So these are kind of those cognitive things, those things that you're experiencing internally. Then you're gonna have some behavioral experiences as well related to your anxiety. This would be avoidance, right? And, and we all do this. We avoid the things that provoke anxiety, whether it's people, places, situations, etc., cetera, um, that evoke any of those experiences, any of those body experiences, any of those, those memory, those cognitive experiences, we avoid that. We engage in protective safety behaviors. Um, this could be, um, repeatedly put it in checking your seatbelts, checking um, appliances being plugged in or not, etc. We may become aggressive as a behavior, verbal abuse of others, lashing out. In fact, one of the most common manifestations of anxiety is anger, and a lot of people don't recognize that. Uh, we may begin to um, use alcohol or other drugs um, in a way to use it as a crutch or a numbing agent. We may engage in compulsive behaviors, excessive checking on things, uh, unreasonable or harmful rituals, uh, very specific routines, etc. And this would be in the case of an anxiety disorder known as OCD, for example. So this is where we see some behavioral stuff around anxiety. So there's, there's those three areas, the physical, the cognitive, and the behavioral. And we're really going to focus on those three domains for the purposes of this series of sessions. Ah, breath. So what causes our anxiety? What ultimately leads to it? Well, that's a question that a lot of people ask, right? And to be fair, anxiety is an equal opportunity disorder. This is the most common mental health concern worldwide. It affects, um, some studies say one in four, some say one in five, but you can assume that somewhere between 20 and 25% of the population will experience anxiety. The great news is it's also the most treatable, so there's, there's that. So there are many different factors that lead to an anxiety problem, but we know that our vulnerability to anxiety is both related to nature, which is our genetic predispositions, and to nurture our experiences. So the nature is what we inherit from our parents, the genetics, and the nurture is our life experience. 
And then when we have specific risk factors, these are the genetics or the experiences that make us more at risk for developing anxiety. And this is really a mixture of these two basic elements. So again, nature, our genetics, an inherited vulnerability to physical and or mental illness, right? So there is that, that piece. And then our nurture, these are these early life experiences. Um, patterns of attachment with our parents, early life stress, traumatic experiences. Sometimes you'll, heard the, you'll hear these described as ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Um, how we learned about protective behaviors or what is dangerous or what is not dangerous from our important elders or authority figures, those, those adults of import in our lives. Um, what traumatic experiences we may have had as children or in our formative years, whether it's accidents, assault, death, near death, um, being attacked by an animal, etc. Then we have those learned um, patterns of cognitive inflexibility. So some really rigid thinking such as um, extreme criticality, like being very, very critical of others or extreme perfectionism, being very critical of self. Um, other factors in nurture, patterns of uncertainty. So you know, not being sure of how we're going to be treated by others. So this could be abuse or neglect during childhood or upbringing, frequent moving from area to area, unpredictable parenting, um, food insecurity, housing insecurity, those economic issues. These would be all factors related to nurture. So you see, it really is a multifaceted piece when it comes to where does anxiety come from? There is no one place that it comes from and no two people will have the exact same set of criteria that create anxiety. So it really is unique to the individual but there are those commonalities, those crossovers. So when ultimately does it become a problem? Well let's talk about phobic anxiety shall we? When fight or flight or freeze goes too far when it predicts danger where no danger exists or when danger is actually minimal, then it becomes phobic. And let's be honest, every human, every single human experiences anxiety from time to time. It is a natural, normal human response. But I often get the question, how do I know if I have an anxiety disorder? So this, this is a really important question. And anxiety disorders are diagnosed when someone experiences anxiety symptoms and it interferes with their life aims, and it happens too often or with too, too much intensity, given the actual danger or, or um, uh, unsafeness, unsafeness um, of the situation. And it cannot be explained by other factors, such as a medical physiological problem or substance abuse disorder. So some people really, experience significant anxiety and simply choose to live with it. They do, they, they just choose to carry on. And it's really up to you to decide whether you can handle the anxiety on your own or if some treatment or intervention is necessary. So let's have a look at the everyday stress versus anxiety disorder. So if you look here at the chart that I have on the screen, you'll see that everyday stress is ultimately in response to a known environmental factor, whereas anxiety is response to the unknown or in response to that experience of stress. Anxiety disorder symptoms remain despite no identifiable stressor, whereas stress or everyday anxiety goes away when the stressor is removed. Everyday anxiety could be something like worrying about class, work, romantic breakup, other important life events, whereas anxiety is constant, it's unsubstantiated and it causes significant distress and begins to interfere with your daily life. You'll hear that phrase over and over again, it interferes with your quality of life. Stress is an embarrassment, self-consciousness, awkwardness in, in those social situations, maybe feeling nervous about meeting new people, whereas anxiety is that amplified. We are avoiding social situations completely due to fear of being judged, humiliated, embarrassed, etc. Stress would be feeling a little bit nervous before that presentation, maybe sweating, maybe, you know, kind of going over your notes repeatedly, a little bit of stage fright perhaps, but minimal, 
Whereas the anxiety becomes panic attacks, right? They seem to come out of the blue and there's that preoccupation with the fear of having another one. And that's really indicative of a panic attack. Um, stress is a realistic fear of a dangerous object. So, you know, maybe I live in the American Southwest and there's, or the South and there's lots of, you know, poisonous snakes. So I have a, a natural fear of, or mindfulness about where I put my feet. Whereas an irrational fear of the same thing becomes anxiety and it's avoiding maybe going outside at all for fear of those snakes or avoiding places that have really little or no actual threat. Everyday stress is making sure that you're healthy, that you're living in a healthy environment, that you're getting enough water, appropriate nutrition. Whereas anxiety is performing uncontrollable repetitive actions such as excessive cleaning, checking, touching, arranging, etc. People will ask, why can't I just get rid of this? Why can't I just get rid of my anxiety? Why can't I just make it go away? Anxiety is necessary. It is as vital to our survival as hunger and thirst. Without it, without our fight, flight, or freeze response, we simply wouldn't be as aware of potential threats to our safety, as of potential threats in our environment. We might not take as good care of ourselves to prepare adequately for the future. So if you think about it, it's like when you're driving along on an icy road or a snow, you know, during a snowstorm, and you are aware of your surroundings and you know when to tap the brakes or react if someone drifts into your lane. That's healthy anxiety. It's that capacity to react to appropriate situations. Unhealthy anxiety would be, you know, avoiding driving in the winter completely, for example. If we didn't have a normal, and I, I hasn't to use that word, but I'm going to say it, normal level of anxiety, we wouldn't enjoy uh, roller coasters. We wouldn't um, experience the thrill, the cathartic thrill of watching a scary movie. Um, we wouldn't we wouldn't engage in things like um, escape rooms and so on. Anxiety is ultimately necessary, right? It protects us and it is not in our best interest to eliminate it completely from our lives. So what's our take home point from this? Well, anxiety is uncomfortable, but it is not dangerous. The symptoms of anxiety in the fight, flight or freeze response are normal. They are functional and they are necessary for our survival. They become the problem when they are too severe, they happen too frequently given um, the amount of real danger present, and if they interfere with the joy and happiness of everyday life. Again, anxiety is uncomfortable, not dangerous. And it's really important that we remember that, that we tune into that experience of uncomfortable, but not dangerous. So sometimes, because it is uncomfortable, we may ask the question, why on earth is my body doing this? Why is my body responding, reacting in this way? And it's ultimately an evolutionary response. We have developed over millennia better ways to protect ourselves. Our brains have learned to automatically signal danger when it's present, or we perceive that we may be harmed in some way. And every symptom of anxiety has a specific evolutionary purpose to help us fight or, or flee, right? So this domino effect of chemical changes happens and, and messages are sent to various parts of our bodies, encouraging us to respond to the real or perceived danger. And this, pro, this process is programmed to last for a short period of time, about 10 minutes, unless it's triggered again. Right? And when it's triggered again, then we go through the process again. And when it's triggered again, we go through the process again. And so we're activating higher and higher levels of cortisol and adrenaline and so on. We'll talk about that more week after next. Ultimately, anxiety is an emotion that we feel in our bodies. Right? So we've talked about these, these physical experiences, you know, the chest pain, the discomfort, and so on and so on. When we experience these physical sensations in that short, short, short period of time, this is the panic attack. Okay, this is the panic attack. And it's important that we recognize it. If we look at the human body, we see where things happen. 
right? And we see the rationale or the reasoning for these things. So if we look at the racing thoughts, this really helps us to evaluate threat quickly, make rapid decisions. Um, it can be really hard to focus on anything else but that feeling of danger in the moment, but there is that purpose to focus on the danger. When we experience changes to our vision, perhaps tunnel vision, um, it's designed to help us focus on the danger. You following me with this? Our heart feet, um, beats more rapidly. Again, this is to feed more blood to our muscles and enhances our ability to, to fight or to run away. This is an evolutionary process. Our breathing becomes quicker, shallower. Again, this is to take in more oxygen and make our bodies more equipped to fight or run away. Our adrenal glands kick in, reducing, reducing, I'm sorry, pardon me, releasing adrenaline. This is signaling other organs in the body to get ready, to be prepared. Um, our bladder urgency is that our, our bladder muscles are releasing in response to the stress. Our hands may get cold as our, as our blood vessels contract in order to force um, blood to the major muscle groups instead of in the small muscle groups. Our palms get sweaty. This is a cooling um, activity in order to make us a more efficient machine and so on and so on. And our muscles are tensing, right? Again, in preparation for activity, running or fighting. This doesn't feel comfortable necessarily, but it is, what is the word? Normal. It's normal and natural, and it is part of how we process anxiety physically to prepare for that real or perceived danger. So what do we need to know? Anxiety is normal. Everybody has it. It is designed to alert us to threats, real or perceived. It protects us from that danger, and it helps us to reach important goals. So I, I often refer to, you know, if you're a runner and you're at the start of your race, that little bit of anxiety help us to get that goal, right? Or if you're, you're playing hockey and, you know, you're driving the puck into the net, that's anxiety. It gives us drive to reach that goal. Anxiety is not always a bad thing. I think it's so important that we remember that. What else? Anxiety is not dangerous. It's not. It is uncomfortable. You betcha. It is so uncomfortable, but it is ultimately temporary and will eventually decrease. The sensations that we experience are really designed to alert and activate us to action, right? They're normal and they're part of our body's natural response mechanism. This is, this is the way our bodies are designed. Our bodies are smart enough to know when to amp up, when to really rev things up, and when to slow down. Unless we have an anxiety disorder. We'll come to that. Our anxiety can be adaptive, right? It can shift and, and change according to the situation. As we learn and process new information, we decide that, oh, actually, that barking dog is not dangerous. I see that barking dog every day on my run, and it's just a noisy dog, so now I'm not fearful. Anxiety really helps us to prepare for that real danger, though, and helps us to perform at our best, just like the runner, the hockey player, um, the public speaker. Triggers our fight-flight response, prepares us to react. Without it, we would not, as a species, survive. We all need some anxiety. We all need some. It is a part of our life and eliminating it completely is virtually impossible. Okay, so if you were, if you were coming here today to find out how to completely eradicate anxiety from your life, I'm so sorry. That's not going to happen. Mm. Need more coffee. Coffee is good. So, We need to remember though that anxiety can become a problem and that's probably why you're here. While small doses are helpful or useful, too much anxiety too often at too intense a level is problematic. It creates issue in our life. If we think of it like a fog that if our anxiety covers everything, if it makes it hard for us to see, and I don't mean like literally physically see, but to see 
the big picture, to see our lives. If it stops us from doing what we usually do, like if I'm driving down <laughs> Albert County, go driving down country and I'm heading down toward Fundy Park and there's full fog um, in Shepherdy Bay, it may prevent me from driving the way I normally drive. If it becomes something that gets in the way, if it prevents you from doing things, if it gets in the way of your relationships, if it interferes with your capacity to do your job, then it is a problem. And this is when it needs to be addressed. It's normal, but some people never kind of grow out of that experience of stranger danger and they become more afraid rather than less afraid as life goes on. And this is causing considerable interference in our lives. When we have this combination of fear and excess anxiety and disruption in life, then we become problematic. Uh, whoops, I've got, a, I've got a duplication of slides here. Sorry, physical response to anxiety. We've talked about these. We've expressed what these look like and the reasoning behind these. So this is the, 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 um, the adaptation of anxiety. I didn't realize I had a duplication of slides in here. My apologies. Um, then we get into the, the reasons for arm muscles tensing up, sweat glands activating, your heart pumping. Again, all the rationale for why the physical responses happen. Um, the larger muscles in your thighs, even, even um, activating your toes, which is really interesting. You may find that um, your stomach and your eyes are impacted. Again, these are the adaptations that our body makes in order to combat or, or manage anxiety. Our brains are designed to keep us safe, okay? They are, they're designed to keep us safe. They're, they're at a, they are adaptive. The anxiety part of the brain, which is called the amygdala, is, is like radar. It's a, a radar screen that is trained to spot dangerous objects or situations. So something blips on the radar and the amygdala goes beep, beep, beep. So when the radar spots something dangerous or something that could be dangerous, it tells our brain to begin that fight or flight response and produces those uncomfortable feelings. So if we think about danger, one thing leads to another. And so we're talking now about triggers or activators. And a lot of people use the word triggers. I tend to prefer the word activator simply because of the association with the word trigger. So when we perceive danger, and I'm gonna use the example of a spider here, because this is something that a lot of people can relate to. So if I see a spider and I perceive it as dangerous, maybe as a child, my, one of my parents screamed and smashed spiders whenever they saw them. Or maybe my mom got my dad to kill the spider every time there was one in the house. This fear, this perceived danger is remembered by the amygdala. So the next time something reminds us of the spider, maybe there's a shadow across the wall or um, a thread on the floor, or we actually come into contact with one, maybe you're out in the garden, then our anxiety alarm goes off. So human sees a spider, equates it to danger or something bad happening, for example, getting bitten by a spider. Maybe we watched too many episodes of Spider-Man as a kid. But really, if we watched Spider-Man as a kid, we'd want to be bitten, wouldn't we? And that creates an alarm. It creates that fear response now and in the future. Okay, so maybe, so maybe it's a, a stinging insect, a bee, a wasp, a hornet, what have you. This is how triggers or activators become part of our internal vocabulary. Nearly anything, nearly anything at all can be trained to activate our fight or flight response. You know, and mental health professionals in all kinds of fields, whether they're, you know, psychi uh, psychiatric nurses, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, licensed counseling therapists, uh, registered counseling therapists, psychotherapists, uh, you know, pick, pick a professional designation in mental health. They've all tried, find, tried to find ways to tell the difference between the different types of anxiety triggers. And this is where anxiety disorder diagnoses come from. And while a diagnosis is not actually a perfect way of describing a person's experience, it can help us to know what kind of treatments might be more effective. So 
I'm going to give a chart here in a moment of the different kinds of activators or triggers and some of the diagnoses that are associated with it. This is not a comprehensive list and it should not be considered the only thing, but it's to give you an idea. Uh, here we go. So if we tend to worry about the future, make predictions about the future, have negative thoughts about the future, this will be described as generalized anxiety disorder. If we experience fear and anxiety around social situations, um, fear of criticism or judgment from others, uh, social events, performances, speaking in public, for example, this would be more social phobia or social anxiety disorder. If we have that fear of having a panic attack and you fear those body feelings that we described earlier or have fear of the feelings that remind us of that panic attack, this is panic disorder. If we have a fear of the places that a panic attack has happened before or could happen in the future, this may be described as a phobic response called agoraphobia. So you see that there are, there are different kinds of responses. Um, we have experience around specific places, situations, objects, injuries. These would be specific phobias. So that might be, you know, your spider, your arachnophobia, um, and so on and so, so on. Fear of heights, your acrophobia. Um, if we have disturbing or intrusive thoughts, unwanted intrusive thoughts, um, fear of contamination, doubts and an urge to check things, repetitive behaviors, this might be called obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, if we have really intrusive memories or um, images or dreams or flashbacks associated with a traumatic event, this would be post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is an anxiety disorder, although it does have kind of its own category in the diagnostic uh, manual. So these are just some examples of what anxiety can look like how it presents and how it might be diagnosed. Why is this important? Because each of these may have slightly different treatment approaches depending on the specifics. So it is important to remember that. A lot of times people wonder whether the scary event caused their anxiety or if the anxiety itself caused them to more readily see things as, as scary. And I think that's a fair question, right? It's a bit of a chicken and egg question. We do know that scientific research on anxiety indicates that both are true. It's not either or. Both events and stress in our lives can create more anxiety. For example, um, if you were a passenger on a flight that barely escaped a serious accident, you may feel anxiety the next time you take a flight. Real, seems realistic, especially if this was one of your first flying experiences. Flying then may become a new anxiety activator. On the other hand, someone who is already vulnerable to having anxiety, for whatever reasons, may experience normal turbulence on a flight as scary, as frightening, as dangerous, and then may feel afraid to fly in the future. So in both cases, there's, you know, both the scary feeling, creating anxiety, and the anxiety amplifying the fear. So there's both happening in that case. So for the faith, for the, pardon me, for the sake of treatment of anxiety, it's important to learn to identify what it was or what it is that makes you anxious. For some people, it's really, really clear. For others, anxiety seems to come out of the blue. It just like kind of just hits you. Spoof, where did it come from? So to identify what makes you feel anxious, to identify your activators or your triggers, Start asking yourself these questions, and these are great to jot down in your journal or your notebook. When I feel scared or nervous, what is going on around me? What am I thinking about? And these are the kinds of questions I would ask in individual therapy. I would encourage clients to think about during, you know, the interim between session to session. When you felt nervous, when you felt anxious, check in with yourself. What thoughts were you having or what was going on around you? Ask yourself, am I worried about having more anxiety in the future? Am I afraid of body sensations, right? Do I, am I scared of having that, that rapid heart rate, that flushing, that, the tingling? Do I ever try to do more than I can handle? Or do I create unrealistic expectations for myself or for others? Do I have perfectionism or hypercritical behaviors? 
am I worried that I won't be able to cope if things go bad or happen badly in the future? These are really important questions to ask yourself to get a sense of what kinds of things are activators for you. So what activates anxiety for me will be different than what activates anxiety for you and will be different than what activates anxiety for your neighbor. It's important that we recognize those things so that we can begin to mitigate their effect, that we can begin to, to dampen the effect they have on us. So the take home point from this is that the brain can be trained or can learn to be afraid of almost anything. Okay, it's true. We can, we can create fear in our brains for almost anything, any situation, any circumstance. There are some that are more common than others, okay? These particular activators or triggers help us define anxiety disorder for diagnosis purpose, which then we use to better understand how to treat that particular anxiety. Anxiety can be caused by scary events and anxiety can also make one more likely to experience an event as scary. Okay, and I, I want you to hang on to that one. Anxiety can be caused by scary events. Um, maybe I had a house fire and I now have anxiety of fires. Or anxiety can make you more likely to experience an event as scary. I saw a house fire and that terrified me because I already have anxiety. It is really important to understand your particular triggers or activators. In most cases, it is possible to figure them out for yourself by asking some of those questions. Okay, what was I thinking about? What did I feel in my body? What was the situation, etc. Sometimes though, it is necessary to seek the help of a, of a professional to do so. And that is great, right? It's, it's super if you do that. It's important to take charge of your mental health. It is so, so important. So now, let's just take a moment and stretch. We're about 45 minutes in. We're about, oh, we're about two thirds of the way through. I'm gonna take a sip of coffee. I'm gonna have a look at the chat for a moment to see if I can answer some questions before we get into the next section. So let's see if I can do this uh, chat. No, there is no electronic copy of these slides, but you can access the video which will have these um, posted in them. Okay, uh, questions. Again, no, we're not, I'm not gonna be sharing a copy of the presentation. You can share the video though. Um, okay, can you have more than one anxiety disorder at the same time? Yeah, there is, there is something called comorbidity or co-occurring disorders for sure. That can definitely happen. Um, it's really unique to the individual. Can someone have post-traumatic stress and OCD? Yes, could they have social anxiety disorder? and um, a specific phobia? Yes, yes, yes is the answer, right? Um, what happens if you go to the doctor, doesn't help you and tells you to talk to someone? Uh, so I, I, I'm assuming you're talking about family physician, um, that we might guess. Um, so that's, that's a really interesting point. Family phys physicians are not typically trained to do talk therapy, to do cognitive behavioral therapy, to do dialectical behavior therapy, to do exposure therapy, and so on. So it's actually appropriate for them to refer you to a mental health professional. Um, if you feel you aren't being helped, um, this is a, a case where self-advocacy becomes really important. Um, and I know that can be really hard when you're experiencing um, a mental health concern, if you're feeling an anxiety um, if you're experiencing an anxiety disorder, it can be really hard to self-advocate. Um, but this is when, you know, reaching out to a mental health professional can be very, very, very um, beneficial. Uh, cluster B and cluster C. So we're talking personality disorders there. So that's, that's outside the scope of this particular conversation. If you'd like to reach out um, outside of this conversation, because um, cluster B and cluster C are um, personality disorders. Um, so we could talk about that in the context of that um, as opposed to anxiety because yes they do correlate to anxiety disorders for example you know it's it's rigid unhealthy patterns of thinking and behavior um, difficulty perceiving appropriateness of, of um, interpersonal situations difficulty there 
distrust, suspicion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are not anxiety disorders or anxiety symptoms per se. They would be more falling into the category of personality disorders. And so I, I'd be more comfortable discussing that in that context. Um, why are we seeing an increase in anxiety disorders in young people today? Oh, that is a big question, Shirley. Um, and the answer to that, um, boy, the answer to that is all the things, all the things, all the things. Um, increase awareness of what anxiety looks like as opposed to just, oh, they're nervous or get over it. There's that. Um, so increase in awareness of, of what it looks like and how to diagnose. Um, increased societal pressures on young people. Um, we could talk about social media comparisons. Um, we could talk about those in, in, you know, huge, huge amounts of the, the, the conversation that would go on about why there is an increase is, is substantial. Um, the access to information, a, a, you know, constant stream of information is increasing the uh, levels of anxiety among many young people. Um, increased pressure around performance, perfectionism, appearance, and so on. Those would be reasons for increase. Those are some of the kind of societal nurture increases. All right, so let's get back to, oops, anxiety fuel. Anxiety fuel. So let's talk about that. I'm having some sort of weird technology issue here. Just give me a second. Uh, all right. So when we feel anxious, we typically want to do something to make ourselves feel better. That, that's a normal, natural human response, right? I don't feel good. I want to do something that makes me feel better. And most of the behaviors that we, that we engage in feel natural because our body also wants to keep us safe. Our brain wants to keep us safe. However, some of the behaviors in which we engage can make things worse. They add fuel to our anxiety fire. We can either add fuel gradually over long periods of time, or we can dump it all on at once and <laughs> conflagration. Big, huge fires. We have to ask ourselves, what behaviors are in danger of causing the anxiety to get worse? So basically anything that teaches the amygdala that anxiety center of the brain, that something is dangerous. So if we go back to our spider example, let's say that every time you see a spider, you try to avoid it. You try to get away, you run away. So what does this teach us? This, this teaches us that spiders are dangerous. Every time we avoid the spider, the amygdala gets more feedback, more information that spiders are dangerous. So next time we see a spider, the alarm gets louder and louder and it may go off more quickly than before. Right, so it's, it's layering on that information. The process by which the brain learns that something is more dangerous over time is called sensitization. It's also sometimes called reinforcement because we're reinforcing the anxiety and the anxiety response gets stronger and stronger and stronger each time. Reinforcement can happen both in the short term when the danger seems to be present or in the longer term. Short-term reinforcement of anxiety is, is what we would call the snowball effect, right? So going back to the speaking in front of the crowd example, we may worry about performing well, about jitteriness. We may worry about our voice cracking, and it can lead to jitteriness, voice cracking. It may lead to difficulty in concentrating um, and other fight, flight, or freeze responses. And often the physical um, anxiety symptoms will then create more worry about the performance. So if I'm worried about the, the performance and then I experience physical responses in response to that worry, then I get more worried and create more physical responses and then I get more worried and we get that snowball, right? We get that snowball, snowball, snowball. In which case our anxiety gets worse and worse and worse and worse, ultimately to the point of panic. excuse me, that can be really scary, 
right? We can, that can be really, really, really scary. So this is short-term reinforcement. Long-term reinforcement, as I mentioned earlier, anxiety fuel is anything that teaches the anxiety center of the brain, the amygdala, that something is dangerous. So we talked about the short-term reinforcement. Over the long term, the most common way to do this, to reinforce the, the behavior, is to engage in negative thoughts, negative beliefs, as well as engaging in protective actions called safety behaviors. And while the behaviors seem to be helpful in the moment, they seem to help our anxiety in that moment, over the long term, they actually make it worse. Okay, so some examples would be, um, I think I have a chart, uh, second, okay, I do, yeah. Um, so, examples. As long as I avoid that thing, I'll be safe. So if I avoid doing that presentation at work, or I avoid uh, going to the dentist, or I avoid, right? Ultimately, that can be worse. It makes, it makes the fear bigger. Attacking others. As long as I use verbal or physical force to protect myself, I will have control. And that's where a lot of anger um, related to anxiety comes from is control. Um, maybe it's a protective behavior as relates to perhaps OCD or intrusive thoughts. Um, as long as I have, you know, um, as long as I have my, I think of Dumbo, as long as I have my Dumbo feather, I'll be fine. Um, there may be some specific rituals related to, to the anxiety and to that safety behavior. Um, excessive washing, repeated checking, counting, asking for reassurance. Am I okay? Are you going to be there on time? Are you sure you're going to pick me up on time? Are you sure that you know where to find me? Um, Etc. There may be some substance use disorders, trying to numb the anxiety. As long as I have a drink, as long as I have some alcohol, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I will feel better. These are some examples. Um, and then some of those safety thoughts. This, this would be, these would be ways to reinforce in the long term. These would be negative thoughts about the future, negative thoughts about yourself, repeated negative thoughts about other people or the world. You know, that, that automatic negative thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my job and end up homeless. I'm not going to be able to support my family. My, my, my uh, wife will leave me or I have to have control. If I'm not in control, I can't handle things. Or you know what, that person thinks I'm an idiot. They think I'm completely ridiculous because I said that thing. They think I'm stupid, etc. Or you know what, if I drive on the highway as opposed to on the back roads, I'll definitely get into an accident. Um, or if I've had this thought and I keep having this thought, then it must be true. So these are ways that we reinforce in the long term our, our anxiety. <sighs> whether in the short term or the long term. Anxiety feelings, fearful thoughts, protective safety behaviors work together to keep our anxiety fire burning, right? They feed it. And each one feeds off the other, fuels the other. And any one of them can act as the, the, the match, I guess, to start the fire, to get the fire going. In cognitive behavioral therapy, the goal is to work on these thoughts and on these behaviors to help extinguish as much of the fire as possible. Are we always going to put out the entire fire? Maybe not, but we do as best we can. So some take-home points about our anxiety fuel. Some of our thoughts and behaviors, while they may seem to help us in the moment actually make anxiety worse. Safety behaviors such as avoidance, protective behaviors, negative thoughts, ultimately serve to reinforce our anxiety in both the short term and the long term. And it is very important to understand what, if any, safety behaviors we are using so that we can work through to reverse them Right? So if it's not, if this is not helping, then let's flip it and see what the, the other side is and see if that helps. So I want you to ask yourself some very specific questions. And this is a great time to jot down some of these questions. I want you to explore these ideas. So I want you to explore the concept of avoidance. Do you do anything because it seems scary 
or do you avoid doing something because it feels scary or makes you feel anxious? So ask yourself, do I avoid certain things because they feel scary or because they make me feel anxious? Are there certain things that I, I really avoid doing? And this could avoid, this could include avoiding thinking about certain topics, avoiding certain types of situations, certain types of people or certain specific people. So write down things I avoid, dot, dot, dot. Make a list. What do you avoid? Do you avoid crowds? Conversations with your mother? Do you avoid thinking about filing your taxes? Do you avoid going to the doctor? Ask yourself those questions. Then explore anger and irritability. Ask yourself, and you need to be honest when you ask yourself these questions or when you answer these questions, do I become angry or irritable and attack others verbally or physically? That's a hard one to answer, right? But to, to really dig in. And if you've answered yes to that one, that you become angry or irritable or, or attack others physically or verbally, then write down times that I become angry. So when is it? When are the times in which you feel your anger activated? So you jot those down. Then ask yourself and answer the question, what do I do when I'm angry? Right? I'm an angry baker. Right? I, I angry bake and I angry clean. Sometimes I go for a run. That's my avoidance. Right? It's also a self-care. So it, it's, it's hard to sometimes figure out which one is an avoidance, which one's self-care. Definitely an angry cleaner. Then what about your protective safety behaviors? Do you find trying to protect yourself in certain situations in order to feel more safe? What are you doing? What are the ways in which you try to protect yourself? So write down, how do I try to protect myself? Do you, do you shut down? Do you put up barriers? Do you have rituals? What are your protective safety behaviors? And this, this requires a lot of introspection, right? This requires a lot of, of, of inward thinking. What about substance use? Do you ever use drugs or alcohol to try to numb your anxiety? Is this something in which you engage? And what types of drug and alcohol are you using? So, you know, ask the question, when or what am I using? When do I tend to use drugs or alcohol? Under what circumstances? What happens when I do? And then challenge your thoughts. What kind of thoughts are you having? What kind of thoughts come up continually? Right? What kind of thoughts make you feel anxious? Write them down, make a list. Thoughts that make me feel anxious are dot, dot, dot. So again, ask yourself, do you avoid anything that makes you feel anxious or feels scary? Write down what kinds of things you avoid. Ask yourself and explore your anger and irritability. Do you become angry or irritable? Do you attack others verbally or physically? What are the activating events or times that you become angry? What do you do when you become angry? How does it, how does it manifest? Do you engage in any protective safety behaviors? What are they? What circumstances do you find yourself in when you engage in those protective or safety behaviors? Explore your drug and alcohol use. Is it something that you turn to when you're feeling anxious? Under what circumstances does that happen? What is the outcome? And then what thoughts do you have? Do you have thoughts that come up continually that make you feel anxious? Do you have those automatic negative thoughts about self or others? Are there specific thoughts that make you feel anxious? These are really important questions to explore so that you understand what activates or triggers your anxiety what fuels the fire of your anxiety. So I'm gonna take a moment and pop into the chat again. 
Is procrastinating? Yes, absolutely. It is a form of anxiety fuel. Definitely. It's one, um, it's definitely, it can be like a, that protective behavior. Um, it can be, you know, perfectionism kicking in. Um, procrastination and perfectionism also often go hand in hand. So that is definitely an anxiety behavior. Is there an electronic copy of these slides? No, I'm afraid not. Um, but again, um, to answer the question that's been asked before, you may, you may review the, the video repeatedly. It is going to be on the CMHA YouTube channel so you can, you can review it at your leisure. <sighs> I have needed to take control. Okay, immigrant, cancer treatment, my golly, abusive husband, separated, single mom, I am resilient. Yeah, you are, Katrina. I am seeing that emotion, external emotional stress is a tipping point. I don't know how to take away some of the control because I can't delegate. Okay, so can't is an interesting word, so I'm going to suggest that it may be that you choose not to. I'm also a perfectionist, yeah, and that does, as I just mentioned, becomes an anxiety piece. Do I need to delve into childhood trauma as well as trauma as an adult? That's a really important question to ask, and it's one that I would encourage you, Petrina, to explore with your with your therapist, with your counselor. Um, it's not something I can I can answer in the context of you know an hour and a half um, webinar. Exploration of childhood trauma is something that should be done under the careful uh, care and guidance of a mental health professional, um, but it is something that a lot of people find beneficial for mitigating their anxiety, their post-traumatic stress. Um, as I mentioned earlier, adverse childhood experiences can definitely be a contributing factor to, um, to small T trauma or large T trauma, depending on the circumstances, and certainly to um, adult anxiety. So I would certainly consider having a conversation with a mental health professional around that on, on a one-on-one -on -one basis and following their recommendation and guidelines for that. Uh, more Q&A. When should you be concerned if it is anxiety or something else? For example, I don't know what activates my anxiety. So again, that's where some of these questions become important. Um, I could be relaxing, then just get, just start to get shortness of breath and can't seem to get a good breath. Then this goes on for hours. Oh golly, okay. So I would certainly, if you're dis discovering, if you're experiencing this for, for prolonged periods, I always would recommend having a conversation with your primary care uh, physician, with your, me your medical professional, to rule out anything physiological, anything biological, right? It's really important that, that we understand that there can be multi multifaceted things happening, that we recognize that sometimes there are physical things happening in our bodies that are not necessarily related, but that may be causing some similar symptoms. So it's important to rule those out. So to answer your question, when should you be concerned? I would always have a conversation with my medical professional around these things and make sure that we're taking a multi-pronged approach, that it's a holistic approach with your, you know, your medical professional, your mental health professional, um, your alternate care professionals, whether it's a naturopath, a nutritionist, a dietitian, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'd be looking at a multifaceted approach. My talk therapist recommended marijuana to deal with anxiety. Is that bad? Uh, it's neither bad nor good. It's really dependent on on the individual situation. Again, that'd be something I would be having a conversation with my family doctor about, about what the recommendations are. Um, because just like any uh, medicine, any um, thing we put into our bodies, there can be interactions. So it'd be important to have a conversation with your family doctor and your pharmacist about what you might already be taking or not be taking that could interact so it's, it's outside the scope of my practice to comment on whether that's bad or good. Can skin ulcers be caused by stress and anxiety? Huh, I'm, skin ulcers, you mean like open sores? I'm, I'm looking for clarity. Can, you know, excoriation is, is um, part of the anxiety disorders, that would be skin picking and so on. So that would certainly be part of that. Um, can anxiety show up in lots of different ways? Absolutely. Can it manifest in multiple physical ways? Absolutely. Don't forget that anxiety causes an increase in our stress hormone cortisol, which is an inflammatory response. So is it possible that there are physical manifestations? Absolutely. I, again, I would want to have that verified by a medical professional, um, but stress can cause all kinds of things, you know, hair loss, weight loss, um, skin problems, 
digestive issues. So our bodies and our minds are, are completely intertwined and suggesting that one exists without the other would be, would be uh, well advised. So having the conversation again from a holistic approach of, is it my nutrition? Is it my sleep? Is it my environment? Is it what's happening in my head? Is it, you know, what is it? And having that conversation with both a medical professional and a mental health professional and kind of approaching it from that dual perspective would be really important. Okay. All right. So let's see where we are. Oh, some more questions. Okay. I have worked with kids that seem to get anxiety from things happening in the world, political and otherwise. Lack of control when, feel, when dealing is definitely a factor. Yeah, and that's, and that's a really great question, Jordan. It's a great, a great observation. Um, the things that go on outside of our own living rooms are definitely um, anxiety inducing. And that, so that would be part of the nurture stuff the the oh, so if we go back let me see if i can go back to the right slide uh, and I, don't, I don't want to make anybody dizzy flipping back to the <laughs> to the to the uh through the slides um let's see here we go nature nurture so the nurture right so if we look at early life experiences right um, so children who are exposed to trauma in the news, right? So traumatic experience, what we know about trauma is really interestingly is that we can experience post-traumatic stress, not just from actual lived experience, but from viewing the experience via the news or hearing about it, for example. So this, this is um, definitely Jordan. It is possible that they are experiencing anxiety from what they're seeing in the world around them. So it's important to mitigate, um, to validate their experience in order to mitigate the impact. Um, lack of control, right? So, so having conversations about what can we do? What are the things that we can choose to control? So it's important to remember that we cannot control other people. We cannot change other people's behaviors. We can only change our response. We can only change how we respond to those to those experiences in the world. So Jordan, when you're working with young people, you might have the conversation with them around, well, what do you think we can do? Or what do you think you would like to do? Um, so for example, um, you know, I've seen young people organizing um, social media campaigns around a topic or um, I, think of, I think of someone like, um, my brain just completely blanked. Um, young people who have created um, a food drive or who organize a protest. These would be ways that they could feel like they have some control, some, some agency with regard to what's happening in the world around them. So these would be opportunities to exp express and explore what they can control and what they can't control. Um, Okay. okay, I'm just going to fly through here, back here, getting is anybody getting dizzy yet? Okay, um, I'm just going to get back to my notes so I don't lose my spot, so I've been jumping back and forth a little bit here. Uh, okay, so we talked about the anxiety fuel, uh, negative and positive protective behaviors again. So, so I didn't really identify positive protective behaviors. I talked about the, the safety behaviors. Uh, Petrina will be talking more about protective factors in later weeks. Um, so I don't want to jump too far ahead and, and muddy the waters. So right now we're talking about those things that we engage in that may not be helpful. Um, Oh, can't eat when I'm very stressed. And that is a very common thing, right? It's the loss of appetite under stress or anxiety. Um, so you realize it's a negative behavior. 
but it's to keep you going, right? So again, these are opportunities to explore alternatives. And we're going to be talking about alternatives to those behaviors um, as the weeks progress. Um, I'm not able to stop what I'm responsible for. Who your children who have anxiety and stress from their dad's behavior, who they still need to see legally until they're 12. So again, um, you're right. You can't, you cannot control other people. What you can do is encourage. There are some really great resourcing and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll address that at the end of the session, Patrina, some resourcing for, for kids, for youth. Um, but there are some great anxiety resources for young people. <coughs> Excuse me. I am full of, um, <clears throat> allergies. Uh, so where we are at this session, um, we've really been talking about what anxiety is. So this, this first session is really about understanding where anxiety comes from, how it shows up, and what continues it or what, what amplifies it. So I think, uh, Katrina, this is what you were looking at was kind of the, the reinforcement behaviors, those safety behaviors and negative thoughts and beliefs. So safety behaviors aren't necessarily positive things. They're things that we believe to be, to be justifiable um, to support our anxiety fears, but in fact are actually long-term negative reinforcers. Um, so here's the summary of today's session, okay? We learned that, I, that symptoms of anxiety are, and the fight, flight, freeze response is normal, that it's functional, and that it's necessary for survival, right? It's part of being human. We learned that it becomes a problem when it's, when it's too severe, when those experiences are too severe, when they happen too much, um, too frequently or too intensely, given the real amount of danger present. Or if they interfere with the quality of our life or with the activities of our everyday life. This is when anxiety is problematic. Having chronic anxiety over long periods of time puts stress on our bodies, as we just talked about a moment ago with the, the increase in cortisol. But it can also be important to remember that anxiety itself is not inherently dangerous but it sure can be uncomfortable, it sure can be unpleasant. And in fact, when it's out of control, when it is, is raging, it can be debilitating. I understand that. We looked at what our body does, right? We covered the ways that, that each fight flight symptom is there as a protective measure, that it has an actual purpose um, that when our body goes into fight, flight, or freeze alarm response, there's that domino effect of chemical changes, messages that are sent to various parts of our body, to, you know, to large muscle groups, to the heart, to the organs, and so on, producing all of these physical symptoms. And we learned that this process is designed to only last for about 10 minutes, unless it is reactivated. And then when it's reactivated, 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 that's when it becomes really debilitating. Uh, we understand and learned that um, the brain can learn to be afraid of almost anything. And that's, that's remarkable, right? We can, we can teach our brains to be afraid of almost anything. And some anxiety triggers or activators are, are more common than others. We learned that anxiety disorder diagnoses are organized based on what actually triggers the anxiety. And we know that anxiety can be caused by scary events. So to speak to Jordan's question, scary events in the world can trigger anxiety. But anxiety can also make us more likely to experience seemingly innocuous events as scary or as fearful. And it's really important for each of us to be able to identify our anxiety triggers. And this can really take some hard work. And I know that it can sometimes feel like, I don't know what causes it. I don't know what it was happening. I don't know what it is. It really does take concentrated work. And this is where working with a mental health professional one-on-one -on -one to really dig into that stuff can be helpful and important. Um, in most cases, it is possible to figure them out for yourself, right? With hard work and focused work and being really aware and mindful and checking in with your body and checking in with your thoughts. But sometimes it is necessary to have the help of a mental health professional. 
we learned about anxiety fuel, we understand that some of our thoughts and behaviors, while we believe or while they seem in the moment to be helpful to us, actually make our anxiety worse. So those safety behaviors, such as avoidance, um, those protective behaviors, those negative thoughts, they actually all serve to reinforce, reinforce our anxiety in both the short term and the long term. And it is so important that we understand how we make our anxiety worse so that we can work through this to change it, right? To flip it around, to, to have a better quality of life. But what if, and this is a question that I get a lot when I'm working with people who have anxiety disorders, what if it really is dangerous? I want to I want to, to really reassure you that we're not trying to ignore anxiety. We're not trying to tell you to calm down because nobody ever calmed down from being told to calm down. We're not telling you to ignore actual real danger, okay? Not at all. One of the goals over, over the course of these informational, these psychoeducational sessions over the next four weeks, and one of the goals of cognitive behavioral therapy in general is to learn and fully understand for ourselves what actually is dangerous and what is not. To understand what we can control and what we can't. To understand how to balance taking risks with keeping ourselves physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually safe. So it's to find that balance, it's to fully understand because if we're living with anxiety, our lens is, our, our experience is filtered through the lens of that, of that anxiety and we have a difficulty in distinguishing truly dangerous experiences, truly harmful um, situations from those which we perceive as dangerous. And if you're here, if you're attending these sessions, it is very likely that the cost of, of trying to keep yourself mentally, emotionally safe is starting to outweigh the advantages. And we'll be exploring more of this in future sessions. So next week, we'll be talking about relaxation. Um, I think I mistakenly put exposure on the next slide. Yeah, so that's week three, exposure and desensitization. Um, so next week will be about relaxation. So let's take some time to answer some more questions. All right, uh, so what have we got here? Is it possible to be continuously in fight or flight? I'm not sure I understand your question, Petrina, but is it Yes, Bella, this is a series. There's, there's four parts in the series, each Tuesday for today's part one, and there'll be three more after this. Uh, to be continuously in fight or flight, turned off the 10 minute duration switch off completely. So I guess you're describing long-term high anxiety. I, um, I would have to know more details, which I don't think is, is necessarily appropriate for this context to understand exactly what you're asking. Um, but do some people live in a heightened anxious state for long sustained periods of time? Certainly. Is it healthy? No. Um, are there ways to mitigate it? Yes. Um, is it always CBT or talk therapy that does that? No. Sometimes there is, you know, there is ch chemical intervention required, you know, medication. Um, I'm not, not advocating for or against medication, just understanding that sometimes that's what's needed. Um, so that would be, again, an important question to have with your primary care physician or your primary mental health provider to ensure that you're, you're getting all of your needs met. Um, the purposes of this four series is not therapeutic in nature, it is, it is educational in nature. So I'll answer the questions as best I can within the context of education, um, but not in a therapeutic context. Is that, is that fair for everyone? Um, I find my anxiety tends to create anxiety. Yes, that's that snowball effect. I get anxiety from thinking about not feeling able to control the anxious thoughts. Absolutely, this is a, this is a common experience for sure, Samantha. 
would you consider it anxiety when a person I try to take space for myself, for example? Yes, that's definitely anxiety. So Samantha's asking if um, instead of feeling rested, you wake up and just immediately jump into getting things done, making the list, and having a hard time taking time to relax. Yeah, that is definitely anxiety. Um, and it's definitely um, important to recognize the value of self-care. I'll be talking about that a bit next week, but especially as it relates to engaging in self-compassion. And it sounds like that's the piece that's missing in your conversation, Samantha, is the giving of permission to take care of yourself, right? That the capacity for self-care is, a lot of people can engage in self-care. Hey, I, you know, I had a bath, I read a book. But there is that feeling of guilt, that feeling of, oh gosh, I should be doing something else. I should be racing around doing other things. I need to be checking things off my list rather than just being okay taking the time to take care of self. So um, I'm going to encourage for you, Samantha, some exploration of the concept of self-compassion. Um, the work of Kristen Neff is really fantastic on that. Uh, really phenomenal work. Um, she talks all about, you know, kind of that self-compassion. And um, the other person is uh, Brene Brown's TED Talk on shame, right? And that's a really important one to talk about because I think very frequently when we have anxiety that involves our should list, it's about shame and guilt. Uh, Petrina, I wanted to give you some resources for children um, who are experiencing anxiety. Um, I would certainly consider um uh, the go zen article uh sorry the go zen program for kids would be fantastic um that's a really a really terrific um resource for kids so go zen there it's a series of videos with mindfulness practices um, breathing exercises and so on it's fantastic for kids um the other resource for kids i'm just going to turn around to my bookshelf for a second and see if i have it right here um, these two, these, this series is great for kids, depending on the age of the children. Um, these are by Bonnie Matthews. There's, pardon me, there's what to do if you worry too much, what to do when you grumble too much, what to do when your brain gets stuck. These are fantastic um, anxiety and emotional regulation resources for kids. Um, I really enjoy those. Um, Oh, the Big Life Journal. Oh, yes, Brittany, fantastic. The Big Life Journal is an amazing resource. Thank you for bringing that up. Such a great resource. Uh, Samantha, yes, Brene Brown. Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F. -F. She does a lot of work on self-compassion. Um, the book. Uh, I can't think of Kristen Neff's book, but if you, if you go to her website, just look up Kristen Neff. She has phenomenal TED Talk on self-compassion. She has some really great um, exploration of, of um, just what it feels like to engage in um, ex exploring that sense of compassion. Tools for adults, specifically for CBT. Yeah. Um, let me pull up a book for you. A couple books. This... Uh, I'll give you three. I'll give you three because you know I like books. So um, this one is a great book that I know that um, the CMHA uses frequently. Um, this is Mind Over Mood. This is a really great, um, great book. It's even you know been recommended by um, Aaron Beck, who was the the father, the developer of cognitive behavioral therapy. So this is a really great one, Mind Over Mood. Um, available like all kinds of places. Um, and I really like the anxiety and phobia workbook. We use this frequently in my practice because um, it talks about, you know, the causes of anxiety disorders, how to change our mistaken beliefs, uh, visualization, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And even gets into like existential and spiritual perspectives, coping with panic attacks and so on. This one's great. And this one is more of a clinician's book, but there are some great resources for for um, the general public as well. So this is the CBT Toolbox. Again, really great cognitive behavioral therapy work. So there's some things. Um, other TED Talks. So TED Talk, um, Brené Brown on shame is really important. And then Kristen Neff, N-E-F-F. -F. 
resources for post-traumatic stress and domestic abuse. Um, I'm going to refer to, oh, I'm going to refer to some resourcing um, with the Centre Beaux Jour um, in Shediac. They have some great information on um, intimate partner violence. Um, so you can check them out. They check out their website. They've got some great links there, some great information. Post-traumatic stress. Um, some of the best resourcing, honestly, around that is from the VA in the U.S., um, Veterans Affairs. And uh, even though post-traumatic stress is, not all, is obviously not exclusive to the military, they tend to have some really good resourcing. So I, I, I tend to think that's a really good resource. Um, if you're interested in how post-traumatic stress affects us physically, I certainly recommend the work of a gentleman named Bessel van der Kolk, K-O-L-K. And uh, he's really talks about the body or Gabor Mate, M-A-T-E. And he talks about how our body um, really holds trauma. So very important to understand where we have that physical and emotional mental connection. Uh, the Shediac resource is the Beausajour Crisis Center, the Beausajour Crisis Center, and they're, they're really committed to supporting um, survivors of intimate partner violence, and they have really great resourcing. Okay, trying to make sure I hit all the chat questions. Sorry, it's a lot of, lot of questions. Thank you. You're welcome, Brittany. Uh, so, super K. Okay. OCD specific resources. Um, there's again a lot of the cognitive behavioral therapy resources would be helpful for OCD. Um, I'm trying to think of one that would be more specific to OCD in terms of are you, if you're thinking of a book or are you thinking of, of, of a practitioner. Um, you know, if you look at, just give me a second, the, the website is is in there. I just have to come up with it. Um, there's a website that provides some really great information around sticky thoughts, which is one of the things that we talk about with OCD. Um, just give me a second and I'll, I'm going to actually look it up because I can't think of the title right this moment. Um, give me a second. I know I have it saved in my tablet. I know that Anxiety Canada has some great resources, but there's another one that I'm thinking of specifically, the International OCD Foundation. Sorry, International OCD Foundation uh, would be a great resource. Um, but Anxiety Canada definitely has resources around all of the anxiety disorders. But if you're looking for, for OCD specific, it's the International OCD Foundation, um, iocdf.org. IOCDF, yes, IOCDF.org. What do you suggest for people? Yes, oh yes, by all means, if you have no questions, feel free and we'll see you next week if you choose to join us. Um, what do you suggest for reading for constantly fearing people are mad at you? Okay, um, check out Brené Brown, The Gifts of Imperfection. It's a great one. Other questions? Other questions? You're welcome, Heather. Okay. okay. You're welcome, Katrina. Thank you. So we are at uh, 1230. Um, I said we would run, you know, an hour to an hour and a half. We're at that hour and a half mark. If there's any more questions, please do ask them. Otherwise, I certainly hope that we will um, see you next week when we talk about relaxation um, and kind of that mitigation. And uh, maybe we'll add some self-compassion pieces in there as well, because I, I hear that that's maybe something that is important to folks. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. I hope, Holly, it's pretty cold down here in southeast New Brunswick, so I hope it's warmer where you are. And uh, we'll certainly hope to see you all next week. And come with your questions, and I will answer them as I can. Um, again, not everything is appropriate for this forum, but I will do what I can with what I can. All right. Thank you all.